in the field of apologetics? Do you have anything this this year or in the next few months that you are uh, going to be pursuing? I know that you put up a lot of YouTube videos, yes. your live videos, and that's been growing like crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there is there something specific that you're moving toward? I want to get to a point where people can take all my content, memorize it, if it's sound, obviously. If it's sound, if it's faithful to scripture, honoring to Christ, absorb it and understand it correctly and make it part of the DNA and multiply it because I want to see a generation. If the Lord is pleased to use me, I want to see a generation, not hundreds, but thousands of apologists and Bible teachers, not just apologists, people who know the Bible and know how to interpret and apply it. I want to see thousands on social media. As long as this door remains open because they're starting to censor us. Mm -hmm. Right now I was doing a live stream for YouTube and every couple of seconds one of my mods was getting her comment deleted by Google. Mm -hmm. That's a new feature on YouTube now. Wow. When you're live streaming, Google automatically deletes comments. Huh. It's starting to do it now. And so today I saw her comments getting deleted like it was going out of style. Mm -hmm. She wasn't saying anything inappropriate or but it doesn't fit the socialist liberal agenda. Mm -hmm. So as long as this door is open where we can use the resources, because God is the one who opens and closes doors, I'd like to see thousands of Christians on social media platforms, whether YouTube, whether Facebook, whether Instagram or TikTok, and learning this information and distributing it for millions all over the world. Because we live at a time where in the comfort of your own home, you can be preaching to people in Africa. Mm -hmm. You can be preaching to people in South Asia, mm -hmm. in China, in Saudi Arabia, in the comfort of their home. And you can be transforming their lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want. As far as if, do I want a bigger platform? In so far that that will reach more people. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, like I said, if I could start apologetic schools mm -hmm. and I can be used on social media to then inspire thousands to start their platforms, mm -hmm. then glory to God. I feel that's what the Lord wants me to do, and I've accomplished my task. Awesome. What were you telling me about my hair? You said that it's time. I said, my brother, you're fighting a losing battle. Yeah. I was fighting that battle. See, I, I, I went bald very young uh, in life. I was in my 20s. Okay. My hair started receding. Yeah. And so I did everything I can to maintain every hair follicle every on the top of my head. Every possible one, yes. And then I said, why? Yes. This, this ship is sinking. Yes, yes. I'm losing this battle. Yes. Let me just raise the white flag. I went bald ever since. Yes. And now I make bald look beautiful. You do. One you like Michael Jordan in that way. Or Charles Barkley. That's a compliment to Michael Jordan. It's not a compliment <laughs> to me. At one time I used to be triple B, big, bald, and beautiful. Uh -huh. By the grace of Jesus Christ, he's given me grace to start shrinking so I can get healthier. You have shrank since last time I saw you. Yeah, hopefully what, keep what, what have you been doing? You got a workout plan or just well, eating better? Number one, I want to give the Lord Jesus uh, all glory because for years I struggled with that. I really did. You know, because we're fallen creatures, we live in a fallen world, we try to find ways to self-medicate. You know, I'm not trying to get psychological. I'm being biblical when, I, when I'm saying this. <clears throat> we have undergone certain things in our upbringing that has left damage that only the Lord Jesus can heal. By his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. And he doesn't just heal us spiritually. That is important. He saves our souls. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ has procured the redemption of the entire person. He's come to redeem and make you whole spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. So it's not just the spirit, the inner man, but it's the emotional makeup, your physical body that's the king. So until glorification, until Jesus returns in glory, and we who believe in him and trust in him are then glorified completely, we're being healed slowly, but surely, and it's a process. God in his wisdom is healing us slowly, gradually, from glory to glory. Now, until we encounter the Lord and fall in love with Jesus Christ, and I pray everyone does, sadly not everyone does, <clears throat> we find other venues to medicate. So one of the ways I would self-medicate, heal my wounds, my low self-esteem or my need for affirmation is I would stuff myself. Mm -hmm. So gluttony became a tool that ensnared me. I mm -hmm. became bound to it because if I get depressed, I felt, if I felt I was being belittled, if, if I sensed I wasn't being affirmed, so mm -hmm. I'd run to food. Mm -hmm. 
So even as a believer, I struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And I would cry out to Jesus Christ, Lord, please set me free. My healing is in you. Mm -hmm. Please set me free from any bondage. So for over, I would say over 15 years, that was my battle. Then glory to God, the Lord, who is patient, who teaches us to be patiently enduring and seeking his face. That's a parable, actually, in Luke 18, 1 to 8. He gives a parable about the per persistent widow. And what he's trying to say is, God desires to give good gifts to his children. You'll find our Lord saying that in Matthew 7. If people want cross-references to everything I'm saying, Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. And then Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11. 7, 11, so that shouldn't be hard. Matthew 7, 7, 11. The Lord encourages the faithful to be earnestly seeking and asking and knocking and not give in because he says that your heavenly Father delights in giving you the Holy Spirit and good gifts because he loves you. And he likens that to fallen creatures, right? He says, if you are evil, he says that. If you mm -hmm. go to Matthew 7, 11, mm -hmm. and Luke 11, 13, the parallel, mm -hmm. he says, if you who are evil know to give good gifts to your children, mm -hmm. though you're evil, you still have this sense of love for your children that you will give them something good. Mm -hmm. You won't give them a serpent or a stone if they ask for bread. How much more, your Heavenly Father? It's an mm -hmm. argument from the lesser to the greater. But God wants us to endure in prayer. And he's using that to discipline us, to train us, to keep praying. Because prayer is a form of spiritual exercise. See, we are given certain disciplines to strengthen our spiritual muscles. Because we're in a spiritual battle. We need to be spiritually trained for spiritual battle. We mm -hmm. have spiritual weapons. Mm -hmm. One of the weapons is persistent prayer. Mm -hmm. So God could answer me in a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. But he allowed me to struggle and struggle. And finally, glory to Jesus. About two years ago, he gave me victory. And I pray in Jesus' name that victory, he will sustain me in it. And I continue to overcome until the Lord takes me. So that's what happened. So now how do you do that? Well, he finally gave me the grace to control my appetite. So appetite was the big thing. How about exercise? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I've always loved to do cardio. My, I used to like bodybuilding. Yeah. I don't like weights anymore, but I need to for the tone, just for, you know. Yeah. But I've always loved to do intense walking. When I was too heavy, I couldn't jog. So uh -huh. I love to walk. Uh -huh. So I would do a lot of walking, a lot of cardio, like five, six miles. And then I tried intermittent fasting, which worked. Uh -huh. So that helped me. In those two areas, the Lord gave me grace. And I pray that grace will be something that stays with me until the Lord takes me. So that's how it that happened. Amen. Cool. When you speak, you're... You're, you have a gifting, a, a great gifting with your mind. You're sharp. Uh, you, you. You're able to recall you. things. I was just curious, you know, was there a certain yeah. was there a certain age where you started to realize that, recognize that, and, and when, and yeah. Yeah, you know, I praise the Lord Jesus that he saves me from realizing this gift that people all notice. Because, you know, we're already damaged and yeah. our tendency is to make ourselves more than we are and get puffed up. Because Paul says, knowledge puffs up. Love yeah. builds up. And for the glory of Jesus, I pray he saves me from myself and my sinfulness and from satanic temptation. And we need to really pray that. Amen. Because you've had some great men of God who believed their own hype and fell. Mm -hmm. And we won't mention any names, but you know what mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. Some who had worldwide impact. Mm -hmm. May the Lord save us from that. In Jesus' name, may we never shame and dishonor the Lord. And what we wrestle with may give us victory to overcome. <clears throat> when you ask me, when did I realize it? When I came to faith, it would have been in the late 90s. And so people ask me, did you do anything to memorize a scripture? And I have to be honest, no, I didn't. What happened was, early on, so it didn't take 20 years to cultivate. Mm -hmm. It was like immediately, once God confirmed to me, do, do ministry, do evangelism, I'd be speaking to a person. And this is within the first year of me coming back to the faith and having a zeal to want to now work for the Lord. Mm -hmm. You talk to me, and verses would flash in my mind. Huh. So it's nothing I've done. All glory to the Holy Spirit, which again, because the Bible is God's word, and the God of the Bible is real, we know what the Bible says is true. So the Bible says the Holy Spirit, according to His own will, has already given specific gifts to all the members of the body of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 12. Mm -hmm. He distributes the gifts according to His will. That's 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 12. Mm -hmm. You can read verses 1 to 11. Just read that section. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit has already decided, when you come to faith, I already have these gifts lined up for you. I already have these gifts lined up for him or her. It so pleased the Holy Spirit that these were one of the gifts he gave me. Mm -hmm. And so you talked to me and verses would flash in my mind. So prior to that, 
you didn't really find that you recalled things yeah. faster than other people? Well, or, I, I don't know or, because I didn't, I didn't need to. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised even before that I had recall. Why? Because the gifts sometimes you're given them mm -hmm. at birth. Right, right. But you may misuse them. For example, right. what do I mean by that? When you see someone who's exceptionally gifted in a field, mm -hmm. like you see Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. we're talking about him, or Muhammad Ali. Or muse, musician. Yeah, or yeah. Michael Jackson. Yeah. All good gifts are from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And every human creature is endowed with gifts and talents. It's what you do with those gifts right. and talents. Amen. So I wouldn't be surprised this ability, recall, was with me growing up. Because prior to that, all I would focus on, sadly to say, I used to be heavily into body and martial arts, so it would be Bruce Lee facts or Arnold uh -huh. Schwarzenegger and body. That was, you know, those are things irrelevant. Uh -huh. And so, if this gift of recall was already there, I wouldn't be surprised. Why? Because the gifts at times are already you're born with them. Yeah. It's you realizing what those gifts are and how you use them. Yes. Amen. So glory to God. The Holy Spirit brought me to saving faith, and then I became aware. These gifts you've had were always intended to be used to glorify Jesus Christ. Yeah. Michael Jackson was born with that exceptional voice. That was given to him because of the Lord to be used to glorify the Lord. Now, what you do with that gift or talent will determine whether you are praised by the Lord or condemned. Now, even, believe it or not, people may think I'm exaggerating. Even the ability to fight physically is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't believe me, read, read the book of Samuel. Chronicles, it lists David's renowned fighting men, people who are known for exceptional military prowess in the battlefield. Because even the ability to fight, even the ability to be successful in the battlefield is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Even craftsmanship, and I'm going to even give you a biblical proof for this, even construction, you being a successful craftsman and constructing is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And where do I get this from? If you go to Exodus 31, yeah. Verses 1 to 6. Yeah. I'm giving people the reference so they can check me up on this. Exodus 31, verses 1 to 6, and Exodus 35, verses 30 to 31. It says, Basaliel yeah. had the spirit of wisdom and understanding in all craftsmanship yeah. to construct the temple of God. I love that verse. See? Yeah. yeah. So, who gave Basaliel the wisdom and understanding to construct the temple precisely the way God, the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So, all gifts and talents are from the Lord. It's what you do with them. Amen. Favorite movie? Wow. That's, or you can name a couple of them yeah. that you really like. or if you One like. of the most influential people in my life that really impacted me was Bruce Lee. Okay. And so, Enter the Dragon. Okay. And Way of the Dragon, Return of the Dragon, where he fights Chuck Norris. In fact, people may not realize it. Even though, sadly, he did not use his martial arts gifting for the glory of Jesus, but for personal gain. His martial arts principles, I employ in my apologetics. People don't know this. Huh. Because his martial arts system, Jeet Kune Do, was a system that you take anything and everything that works and works for you as an individual. Because my body structure, my reaction time may not be the same as yours. And you absorb that and make it instinctive to you. And that when you're confronted, the best defense is an offense. You go on the attack. That's how I do my apologetics. Yeah. That's exactly, if you pay attention, when I know someone's going to bring an argument, I not only respond, but I turn it against them and then decimate their objection. Yeah. This is precise, This is actually the Jeet Kune Do, Christianized Jeet Kune Do for apologetics. Okay. So him, huge influence. In other movies, well, I would, say, I would talk about shows, like uh, one of my favorite shows that really impacted me was The Honeymooners. That show when I would be sad and lonely. Even now, I just watch those episodes. Yeah. Amazing, clean-cut comedy yeah. of a man who was poor and was ambitious because he always wanted to provide better for his wife, a better life for his wife. And he came up with ideas and he would fail consistently. And the moral of the story is, you keep trying, trying, trying until you succeed and that True love is not based on material possession. See, that's the theme. Because he had a wonderful wife that no matter how much he failed, she loved him to the end and was faithful to him to the end. So there was a moral to that story. Yeah. So I always watch that. Okay. You know. Favorite musical artist slash, uh, I guess, genre of music? Yeah. 
I'm kind of weird. Uh, I like, I, I don't usually go with a particular genre. What it is is it's the beat, the melody, and at times the words that leave a deep impression on me. So I like to hear music that will put me in a trance-like state. Not you know, When I say trance, i got to be careful. I don't want people thinking I'm opening myself to the spirit realm. Meaning where it will allow me to be lost in my own world and in my own fantasies, and I envision what the future will be like. So it's not one particular music that does it for me. It's a certain melody that I hear, certain beat, certain words. So I used to listen to a lot of heartthrob in the 90s. If you guys, I'm dating myself, 90s, it sounds like, you know, you're my dream girl. You know, I can't sing, man. But oh, you know, or like <laughs> spring love, come back to me. Why? You know, stuff like that. Yeah. And also, I love songs that would make me go deep into my pain. Uh -huh. Like for example, I, I love the song "Dust in the Wind." Uh -huh. Dust in the wind, or even the Beatles "Yesterday." Yesterday. Yeah. See, because those words is a reflection on pain pain that has scarred the person in question and has impacted that person whether for good or bad uh -huh. and so I like that that kind of music because it makes me reflect on some of my painful traumatic experiences and to dig deep into them so I can learn from them and go beyond them so those kind of music makes an impact on me. One thing I wanted to ask you I was uh, I was on YouTube and I was watching um, uh, a YouTube channel called What Do You Meme? Yeah, that's my boy, John and, uh, McCray. And he mentioned Sam Shamoon, and John. so I was uh, I was wondering, you know, uh, did, is, does he live, have you have you met him Yes, we've met face to face, and Lord willing, I'll be meeting him again in about a week from this recording. Oh, okay. So from a week from this recording, if the Lord wills, I'll be meeting him. So a, a wonderful brother, loves Jesus Christ, and God is really using this man because his YouTube channel is What Do You Meme? Yeah. M-E-M-E. -E, so he's known for that. And glory to God, it's gone viral. I think yes. what he has, several hundred thousand yeah. subscribers? Yeah, a couple hundred Praise thousand. the Lord. Yeah. It may continue to increase for the glory of Christ and the Lord provide for him and keep him in love with, with our Lord Jesus. So yeah, he's great. And he had me on to discuss, again, oneness modalism. Mm -hmm. This false teaching yes. that masquerades as Christianity. Yeah. View of the Godhead. Yeah, because I saw a, one of his recent videos where he was talking about, you know, Brandon Tatum yes. and, and all of that yes. stuff. And, yes, yeah. and we need to do, we need to engage because a lot of people don't know, there are those who profess to be Christians of the Christian faith that will tell you Jesus is God. So at first glance, you're going to think that they believe what you believe, mm -hmm. but they're anti-Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. So they'll tell you Jesus is God, and they believe the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, like, oh, wow. But they don't believe the Son, as the Son, existed eternally before creation as the Son. Mm -hmm. There are various mutations of modalism. And for those who are not too familiar with church history, and I'm no scholar of church history, but I was forced to at least study enough to learn about some of these aspects. Most of us are students of scholars, so <clears throat> I'm one of them. I'm a student of scholars, those who studied you will find a mutation of modalism in the late second, early third centuries of the church. And you'll find prominent orthodox, when I say orthodox, I mean those who represented the true faith, the true church, the true doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find prominent orthodox theologians whose writings not only have been preserved in the original language, but are translated. Mm -hmm. One of whom was Tertullian, mm -hmm. who you can read, he wrote in Latin, but translated now in English, against Praxius. Praxius was a gentleman who believed that Jesus was the Father in the flesh. Huh. So this form of heresy was already tackled with and refuted early on. In fact, I tell people, every heresy that we encounter today, you'll find some ancient precedence for it. You'll mm. find an earlier form of this heresy, mm. right? So it's like Solomon says, nothing new under the sun, mm -hmm. literally. Satan simply repackages the same lies over and over again. Mm. It's the same lie, but he tries to finesse it or repackage it. So God, who is faithful to his church, who loves his church, has always raised up men and women who love the Lord to the point they're willing to die for him to defend the truth. So you can read his thorough refutation of this heresy that Jesus is simply the human manifestation or human nature of the Father. He refutes it thoroughly from the Old and New Testament, showing no, 
Father and His Son and the Spirit have always existed distinct from one another mm. as three eternally distinct personal relationships who love one another even before creation. Mm. Modalists don't believe that. Today, you'll have a group of modalists that'll say either Jesus is the human manifestation of the Father or He may be a human being indwelt by the Father. Okay. Either of which is heresy. And the Holy Spirit is simply the Father in a different manifestation. Now, uh, so Tertullian, that's one. Is there Novatian. Any, is the Novatian, other. Novatian. Is, that's the name of, his, of the writing. That's right, yeah, another one. Is there any others that you would suggest for people who want to get better at their at knowing the the know, ancient the, or modern. knowing what the early church I, I'm yeah. interested in like the early church fathers. These are know. the two most prominent. Yeah. It's Novatian against Sabilius, I believe that's the name, and then you have Tertullian against pra uh, Praxius. But if you want to read just the Father's defense of the Trinity, read Justin Martyr, read his first and second apology, and read his dialogue with Chifo the Jew. Justin Martyr is a second century Christian yes. apologist who mm -hmm. died as a martyr. Most of these men were killed, and they died gladly. In fact, mm -hmm. they were looking forward to being killed for Jesus. That's how much they love Jesus. Mm -hmm. May the Lord make us worthy of their company. Yeah. Love the Lord with their zeal. Justin, that's why he's called Justin Martyr. He was a Samaritan who was steeped in Greek philosophy who converted to the faith. Now, he made a defense of the Christian faith to the Roman emperor because Christians were persecuted and he was writing a defense explaining why Roman persecution of Christianity is unnecessary and unfounded because they perceived the Christians to be a threat because they were no longer sacrificing to the gods and goddesses. And at that time, if you want to ensure victory or prosperity or health, you had to appease the gods and goddesses. So you had to run to the temples and offer sacrifices, or the gods and goddesses could be angry and punish you. And so when you had drove, droves of pagans converting Christianity, that means less people offering sacrifices to gods and goddesses. And they thought, saw this as dangerous mm -hmm. to the well-being of the empire. Okay. And so Christians were being killed for that. So Justin Martyr writes a defense trying to protect Christianity from the slander of the pagans, because they were accused of being atheists, believe it or not. Mm. Why atheists? Because they denied the existence of the gods and goddesses. And Justin says, no, we're not atheists. We believe there's only one true God, and that's the Father, and His Son in second place, and the Holy Spirit in third place. Mm -hmm. We're not atheists. And then he wrote his debate with a Jew. It's called Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Phenomenal. Because he just uses the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, to prove the Trinity, and that Jesus is the God who appeared visibly, often in human form, to the patriarchs and the prophets in the Old Testament. Amen. So that tells you how steep they were in the Hebrew Bible and how well-versed they were in the evidence from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, for the triunity of God and Messiah being the God-man. Something we need to rediscover because sadly, not only do we have Christians who are not familiar with the Old Testament evidence for the Trinity, they're not even grounded in the New Testament. Yeah, and, we some, need to people, cure that by the and some people are trying to squash the Old Testament and say that it's not important. Oh yeah, or well. the revelation of the New Testament, I'm sorry, the revelation of the Trinity, my, my apologies, is something that takes place at the Incarnation when Jesus becomes flesh and the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit is poured out. So you won't find the Trinity articulated in the Old Testament with the clarity you find in the New Testament. The Old Testament is what they call a dimly lit chamber. There are hints there. But it's the New Testament light, and then we'll lighten up those hints. So really, to go to the Old Testament or the Trinity, that doesn't take place in the Old Testament. It takes place when Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary, God becomes flesh, the eternal Son, and the Holy Spirit is poured out. And the New Testament is the written, it's the inscripturation of the revelation of the Trinity. But at the same time, you did a whole night on the Old Testament, yes. which was awesome. Exactly. And by and, the way, and you brought up all kinds of things where I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even consider And you know where that. I got that from? The church fathers. No, so. I didn't invent anything. No, I'm not that smart. I wish I could take credit. Yeah. So I can have everyone looking, up to, looking to me. But yeah. I don't. This is simply a tradition that was always believed by the heirs of the apostles. These people were either the disciples of the apostles, mm -hmm. they were appointed by the apostles, mm -hmm. or the disciples of the disciples of the apostles. Amen. This is the ancient tradition of the church. What's happened is in, that in Christianity today, due to the rise of liberal critical scholarship, 1700s, 18th century, out of Germany, of all places where the Reformation started, you had the rise of anti-supernatural <clears throat> scholarship where if God did exist, he didn't inspire people. They were more like deists 
if not atheists. So this type of scholarship started deconstructing the Bible and destroying its divine origin. Mm -hmm. And that kind of scholarship permeated Europe and then found its way in America so that we're still suffering the fruits of that scholarship. And that scholarship basically says, well, hold on. If there is a God, he doesn't personally get involved in the way that the church has taught he did. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he doesn't really inspire human authors to write down his words. Well, then how can the Old Testament be a record of the Trinity? In fact, how can the New Testament be a record of the Trinity if these are simply a collection of fallible books written by fallible men apart from Revelation? Mm -hmm. So because of the fruit of that type of scholarship, the Enlightenment, it permeated its way in our churches and our institutions. So you'll have evangelical Christians, even Catholic scholars, who will be hesitant to say, that you can find the Trinity in the Old Testament. Of course, the New Testament is a more fuller, more rich, and greater mm -hmm. revelation. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. The coming of Jesus is now a greater. Mm -hmm. In fact, it is now the perfect revelation because Jesus is perfect man, mm -hmm. perfect God, perfect man, and his revelation is perfect and complete. Everything is pointing to him. But that doesn't mean that the understanding that the God of Israel, who is the one true God, is multipersonal, wasn't there in the Old Testament. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this kind of scholarship has now permeated even our institutions, where if you try to say to a professor, I can show that the Old Testament prophets were aware that God is multipersonal. There's more than one divine person. They will scoff, scoff at you and brush it aside. Because mm -hmm. many of them are not even convinced you can use the New Testament to articulate an explicit doctrine of the Trinity. Yes. Amen. So we need to go back to our ancient roots. Amen. If you had all unlimited finances, unlimited money, okay, yeah. um, what what would you be doing? Maybe you'd be doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, what would you? Yeah. What What would you be doing? Well, I pray that what, that my answer is from my heart because it's one thing to say what you would do, and another thing when you have that money. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so yeah. if the Lord sanctifies me and to really live up to my convictions, if I had unlimited money, one thing I want to do is fulfill Matthew 25. Because there, our Lord, and if you go to Matthew 25, 31 and 46, he says it clearly. One of the <clears throat> grounds for judgment will be how you have loved others. <clears throat> and in what sense would I mean loved? He says, he says, when the Son of Man comes with his angels and he'll sit on his throne of glory. This is Matthew 25, 31 and 46. Because all the nations will be gathered before him. He'll separate, he'll separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep on the right, the goats on the left. And he says to the ones on his right, welcome you, <clears throat> beloved of my Father, into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. See? I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me to, uh, to drink. I was sick and in prison you visited me. I was a stranger you took me in. And then the Lord says, the sheep on the right will say, Lord, when do we see you? He goes, when you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And the ones on the left, he goes, depart from me, you accursed, and to the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you did not feed me. So right there, Jesus says, if you truly belong to me, and you truly love me, you will love the needy, the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, and meet their needs practically. And that's James 1, 26, 27. He says, what is pure religion before God? That you take care of the orphans, visit the widows, right? And keep yourself undefiled from the world. We will, we will practically love orphans, widows, homeless, the sick, the imprisoned. We will meet them and feed them and love them in the name of Jesus. So that has to be a priority. That's number one. Number two, make sure those men and women who truly love the Lord, truly, not lip service, not doing it for fame or fortune, are fully financed to do the work of the Lord. That's number two. And number three, obviously, I would love to see apologetic centers, institutions built to then thoroughly saturate every member of the body of Christ who wants to, to learn the faith thoroughly and accurately and live it out for the glory of Christ and go out there and be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, without charging them a dime. Mm. These are the things that I think are priority. Because what we have, though, is even though the Internet has been a great blessing, all you do is pay for internet, and you got so much resources that in prior generations, they would dream of having mm, for free yeah. lexicons and dictionaries and interlinears so that you can be a scholar at the comfort of your own home. 
and yet the level of biblical illiteracy is alarming. Mm -hmm. This generation knows less of, than the Bible than a bygone era. If you look at the church fathers, they didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the software, the Bible software like mm -hmm. They couldn't even own a personal copy of the Bible. It's too expensive. And yet when you read their writings, they are saturated with the Bible, quoting it from memory mm -hmm. in their written responses because they couldn't go and pick up, okay, uh, where's the Bible? Because these were either scrolls or early on the churches did use what's the modern equivalent of a book, you know, the codex, but they couldn't carry it with them. They would leave it in the church. Mm -hmm. And yet their depth of understanding of the Old Testament and New Testament and their ability to recall it, it was amazing. It's something that I rarely find among Christians today. So we would need to put a desire by the grace of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of Christians to want to learn the Bible, eat it up, be saturated with the Word of God, live it out, and therefore we should have learning centers that are free. Right mm -hmm. now, we have the tragedy of sending people who want to be in ministry to colleges and seminaries where they end up in debt up to their eyeballs mm -hmm. and can come out in debt. Mm -hmm. Why should we do that when, if you look at how the Lord has designed this church, you are supposed to receive a biblical education in the church that you're a member of by qualified bishops. And from the midst of us, then you appoint those who will succeed you. We don't hire from the outside. It's not how they did in the biblical. Go read it. Don't take my word for it. Mm -hmm. Read New Testament. How did they appoint? An apostle would come to an area, would convert people, spend years with them teaching the faith, and then would see among them someone that the Holy Spirit was showing him, this man's qualified to be a bishop. They'd lay hands on him, say, now you take over. And then you appoint bishops. And that's how it was. One bishop appoint another bishop. Now, if you look at it, we don't raise pastors from our midst. We hire them from the outside. Mm -hmm. Someone who's gone to seminary. Oh, what seminary you went? Oh, what? That's not how it's That's not how it's us. We need to go back to the biblical way of doing things. That's, awesome. that's what I would do. Awesome. Is there anything, uh, one final thing you want to say to anybody watching that maybe isn't an early believer or yes. a young believer um, uh, in the apologetics field or to encourage them? Yes. I would really, really emphasize crying out ceaselessly, day and night, without failure, to the Holy Spirit to guide you. I mean this from my heart, and I'm going to share my testimony, just to be encouragement. My style of preaching is not going to be something that will appeal to everyone. That's why God raises a variety of people variety of personalities and temperament because God will use you to reach a certain group that I may not reach and there's a certain group that will like my style maybe not yours but that's how it is so that no one person becomes the focus mm -hmm. all focus goes to Jesus I say that because I want to give myself as an example I've never been to Bible college never been to seminary never been to university the highest education I got was a GED why am I belittling myself because it's, oh man, dude, you're basically an idiot from worldly standards. Well, for two reasons. Number one, this is proof of what the Holy Spirit had Paul write in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29. I want everyone to go read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 29. It says, God, in order to embarrass the so-called wise men of the age, the so-called philosophers and scholars who thought that they are so knowledgeable, so in their knowledge, they thought they didn't need God, or in their knowledge, they rejected God's existence. It says, God, in order to humiliate them, chose the foolish things of the world, mm. meaning those that the world looked down upon, marginalized, oppressed, and pretty much treated them as idiots. Mm. And he goes, I'm going to take these so-called idiots that you call idiots, and I'm going to raise them up and fill them with such wisdom to make you look like idiots and make your wisdom uh, uh, expose it for what it is, foolishness. And so that's why I'm boasting about my background. Here was a fool by worldly standards, and God said, I'm going to take you, consider it a fool, and I'm going to teach you how to silence the wise men of this age, which leads me to the second point. I was challenged by a Muslim early on, and he rocked the foundation of my faith. And I remember going that night in tears, asking God, and I did this not just one night, but I did it mm -hmm. until God answered me. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying do this. I said, God, please give me answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, if you do, I will devote myself by the power of the Holy Spirit to make sure no other Christian gets humiliated like I did, but to then provide answers for them so they have no doubt about the truth of the faith. And here I am, I stand before you. So my advice is, cry out to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Please, Holy Spirit. You were sent, because Jesus said, He sends the Spirit of truth to guide the church into all truth. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and he'll abide with us forever. So Jesus can't lie, and the Holy Spirit can't lie, and the Holy Spirit can't fail. He's almighty. He is real because Jesus is alive, so he's with us. Cry out, Holy Spirit, please. You've been sent by the Father and the Son to guide me into all truth, to teach me your word, to know what your word is, and how to apply it and live it out of love for Jesus. I give my life to you. I surrender all. Teach me and enjoy the journey. Awesome. Well, thank you for watching. Um, and check out Sam Shamoon on YouTube. I don't know if it's, is it still under Shamoonian? Shamoonian, like Shamoonian. Yeah. Yes. And, um, yeah, and, he, and if you want to know more about uh, the Oneness Trinity debate, wow, Ch check out his videos. If you want to know more about the is um, objections to Islam, that all of those yes. things, he's got a bunch of stuff on those and obviously more. So God bless y'all. Yeah. Thank you.